Hey everyone, welcome to the UVD Weekly Wrap-Up, where today we have a special episode for you to talk about a question. A question? Yeah, we actually got a fan mail. So Again? Yeah, another fan mail. We're still mail. getting those? Yeah, wait, this is number two, so don't, oh. don't get worried. We're not too far deep into this. But we have a second letter, this time coming from Corey. From Where Wisconsin. is he from? Wisconsin. Oh, the land cheese of the heads. cheese. Yeah, the land of the cheese. Uh, basically, he says, Hi, Travis and Ben. This guy watches. He included this guy. I know. Love the show. First time for everything. Love the show. That's what he said. That's a surprise. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. You're part of a small minority. (laughs) I'd hate for him to lead with, I hate you, but here's a question anyway. (laughs) So let me finish out reading this one, though. So he says, I have a question for you. I am an artist that has been working on character design for about the past 10 years. I recently discovered the art toy scene and wanted to know what I would need to do to produce a toy. Any info would be great. Well, you're lucky, Corey. We have a lot of info for you. We recently embarked on a similar journey. A long peyote field quest to make a Luna. Yeah, so we recently uh, did our Kickstarter and went through this process of, um, and we're about halfway through, so we can't say we have all the info, but we do know what we had to do to get this far, so we can help you out with this, Corey. I'm glad we can help. I've heard other people shirk off questions of how to do things and where to get them done. So, first question. First question you need to ask yourself is this. Is there a following for your artwork slash characters? That, that's a big thing, because you're going to be investing a lot of time and a lot of money into a product and um, you don't want to be, I don't want to say wasting money, but putting a lot of money into something and then just kind of sitting on it unless you just have money to spend. I think a subset of this is to have honest friends, yes. not, not just yes men, but honest people who either tell you that that's not going to do it. Again. Yeah. And people that can actually, um, that can critique you and not be like, rude about it. Just like saying, Hey, I think if you did this, it might be a little better. Um, I think that's really important. Um, because sometimes I think people don't actually ask around or review things before they go and make the leap into making something. And I guess you can kind of get away with that in some of like smaller scale, like resin production and things like that. But if you are looking for, um, you know, to go large scale into the big leagues, large scale resin production or large scale vinyl production, it's important before you sink lots and lots of dollars into it to make sure that you have a solid design that's functional and people actually kind of want it. So that, that's your first question you need to ask yourself. And then the second question is, how big is your following? So if you're, you know, if you and like 70 people in your neighborhood really like what you're doing, you know, like that's really great. But if you're like, you and like half the Three half the friends half the world know who you are then that's a whole nother story so like the reason this is important is do you think you can sell 50 of your design 100 of your design if you could sell 50 then you may want to look at going a different direction than vinyl production maybe you want to go into the resin world if you can sell 200 300 1000 pieces anything that makes our later explanations worth the money Yeah. So you then want to probably, you know, you can look into vinyl production or even having a resin piece produced, you know, in China or wherever else you want to do it. So, so our first piece of answer is small scale resin, which really just it's materials like the stuff to make the the resin and the mold. Yep. And And a a pressure pot. Yep. And you really, um, you don't have to have a pressure pot, but it really helps get the bubbles out and helps kind of take your resin production to the next level. Um, But if you're just starting out, you can go, go just fine without a pressure pot. But as you learn, you'll probably want to purchase one of those for your, uh, you know, your process. If you really like doing it and you really start to see the market grow. And Uh, at that point, the the mold's going to be the expensive part or the part that may take you a while. If you're wanting to do it completely DIY and make your own mold, which a lot of people do. Or you could buddy up with people that you either trust or people that you're referred to yep. who may make a better mold to give you a better uh, first step into this. Yeah. So the big thing that we kind of jumped ahead on here was that in this process, you will need a sculpt. <laughs> so before you can even start resin sculpt or resin casting, you would need something sculpted in either sculpty or clay or wax or whatever kind of your sculpting is 
and to convey your parts and pieces. So if it's going to be a multi-part resin uh, piece or multi-part vinyl even, you're going to need to know how to break this figure apart so they can be cast. So if it's going to be a one-piece mold, you know, one-piece shot, kill, resin, that's a lot easier than say, okay, it's got a head that comes off, a body, two arms that come off. That's going to co- require a lot more technique when learning to mold. And so. if it's a one piece, there are certain shapes and angles that you actually want to avoid because they're yep. they're good traps for bubbles and just hard to resolve. Yeah, and that's and that's something that if you want to go that route, you're going to have to find somebody who's casting in resin. Um, you know, there's artists out there that I'm sure love to talk about this. Um, I would say, you know, if there's somebody you really like, um, maybe just ask them a question sometime about molding and casting. Um, I'm sure they would love to talk. There's also forums out there that where people talk about this as well. So, And honestly, as a tiny bit of a plug, we're actually mentioned in a pamphlet that talks about resin casting by Lunartic, yep. where he's taken the time and broken down how to make it, drawn pictures, used words for somebody who's starting out completely fresh as a, a DIY for rudimentary beginnings. Yep. And uh, he actually has been running... Um, what do you want to call it? Workshops. Like a, workshops. That's what I was looking for. Um, he's actually been running those at a few places like uh, um, ToyCon UK. ToyCon UK. And I believe he had some like, some colleges and stuff over in, in Europe as well. So even though you're in Wisconsin, you know. Hit him up. Hit him send, up. Send him an email. Yeah, or pick up his book, a uh, little pamphlet thing. So that's kind of the, if you are a small scale artist looking to create your own toy out of resin, um, if you want to do paint, that would be a whole nother process, you know, to prep the resin to be painted, you have to prime it. Um, and then you have to Sand obviously it. know how to paint. <laughs> so depending on where you're at, um, you know, have fun. Be yeah. prepared to fail the first time out. Yeah. I hear a lot of people say that, but there's a lot of people out there that started out, you know, making stuff, um, rather, rather simple. And now they're doing a lot more complicated resin production right there in their garage or workshop or wherever they're doing it. So It can be done, I guess, is what we're saying. So depending on where you're at, there is a chance that you might have an artist following big enough to warrant a vinyl production toy and going through that process. Uh, If you do... Show them the money. Show them the... (laughs) Yeah. You're going to have to have some pockets, some deep ones. Um, It costs a pretty good penny to make anything, um, you know, in vinyl, really. Um, we, we did a Kickstarter. We raised $13,450. And truthfully, it's probably not going to be enough to produce um, Luna all the way through the end. We will be, you know, putting in our own money to help uh, finish it out and get it out to everybody. Um, it's, it's That's because we're making it perfect yeah, for you. <laughs> making it perfect. No, it's just there's, like, costs you don't think about, like, um, when you're working with the factory. Um, things like wire transfers. Yeah, they're not that expensive, but you have to do a couple of them. And next thing you know, you spend a hundred bucks or so just sending money, like something you just didn't even think of. So there's like little things throughout the process that really can add up, you know, as you're doing the process and you can't, unless you've done this, you haven't, you haven't planned for those things. So that's the first thing you need to have money. You need a prototype and you could either sculpt that yourself or you could hire a sculptor. There's plenty of those in the scene. Shinbone creative, uh, October Toys, Wet Works, uh, Wet Works, uh, Big Shot Toy Works, um, David Orowski, that's who we use for Luna. Um, there's all kinds of people out there that you can find. Uh, pretty in plastic, uh, they do prototypes as well. Uh, plenty of people throughout the scene that create lots of prototypes. So um, if you're in that market, you'll want to have that before you can go to the factory, which you'll have to get a factory from somewhere. You can search on the internet, which is kind of risky, or you can ask around. Uh, people will share that information. Um, Maybe warm up to them, have them warm up to you a little bit before you just yeah. kind of blindside them with a question yeah. of where they get their stuff made. Yeah, so there, people will share. Uh, it is much more tight, tight-lipped tight in the Safubi market. So if you're looking to make like a Japanese vinyl type toy, um, there's a, a lot considerable backups and like a lot of, um, you have to kind of be in the know in order to get into uh, production there. So things are slightly harder, but there are people you can go through. Um, and again, you'll probably want to ask around um, and maybe you know warm up those people and you might be able to get some information on that. Um, once you get a factory, then you can get a quote. And that's where you'll really find out how much money that you need. So at that point, if you have a quote, this is where you have to decide 
okay, if I'm going to spend 10 plus thousand dollars in order to produce this thing, am I going to take that money out of my own pocket? You know, or my friend's pocket or my parent's pocket. Or your or trust fund. Trust fund pocket. Or go, am I going to go get a loan from a bank? Or am I going to do some sort of crowdfunding, such as Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, to raise the funds for this? Um, if you take it out of your pocket, that's great. I mean, well, we weren't personally able to do that at the time when we created our toys, so we chose the crowdfunding route. Um, it's important to know when you do crowdfunding that uh, they take a percentage of funding, so you'll need to add that to your quote um, that you receive from the factory. You will also need to add in things. This is regardless of if you're doing Kickstarter or not. You will need to add in things like shipping. So shipping from the factory to wherever you're going. Distributor. If you have a distributor or if you have your house, <laughs> wherever you're putting the toys, uh, you will need to account for that. Um there you'll have to find a shipper. It's not like, Hey, here's the post office. It's you got to find somebody that's going to be the courier for that. Um, you'll also need to take into account things like packaging. Usually the quotes will include packaging, but you'll want to make sure that's in there. Um, there's all kinds of things like that, that you don't always think about, but you'll need to make sure are in there. And, um, and if you don't have room, you may have to rent an area to hold, yeah. Your quantity of stuff. Yeah. So if you don't have like a garage or a distributor, um, you would need to probably find some space. Um, so if you do decide that uh, you, you know, you've got the funding, got a Kickstarter or something like that, you got to talk about how you're going to sell the toys. So if you did it on Kickstarter, you sold, you know, some things through the Kickstarter, but you'll probably produce more um, because you know, the order quantities and whatnot, you'll need to make more of things. So um, at that point, you'll need to find a distributor or you'll have to figure out how you're going to sell it either on your own site or if you're going to contact uh, galleries or toy stores or wherever to collect, carry your toys yourself from yourself, you'll have to do that. Um, DKE Con toys or conventions disperse, for loose money yep, or disperse uh, would be the distributor. Um, they, you know, they represent many designer toy um, artists in the scene and that'd probably be the, the route I would go if you're looking for a distributor. Um, but if you're going to do it yourself, that's going to be a lot of legwork finding toy stores and places um, you know, willing to carry your toys. Uh, but it can be done. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it can be. Um, other than that, you know, like once you get to that point, if you're selling toys, you're doing pretty good. Um, not saying you're going to get rich selling toys, but if you have a decent market and a decent... Uh, um, following eventually you will probably sell all of your toys. It's a, it's, it's just having that solid base. Cause when you have to produce in the 500 to a thousand minimums, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna run into, um, a, a decision where it's like, okay, well it costs X number of dollars to make this. Do I want to risk it that if I produce a thousand of these, I have to sell 500 to break even. And, and then, how are you going to do that? Yeah. And how am I going to sell 500? Um, let alone the other 500 <laughs> have a custom show. Yeah. So there's lots of things you can do. Like you could have a custom show, um, you know, to help hype the figure. Um, the other thing is you're going to want to do is advertise the figure. You're going to want to contact people like Spanky Stokes, Tenacious Toys or us, us, UrbanVinylDaily.com or, um, you know, Vinyl Pulse or Toys uh, Are Evil, Toys Are Evil, Toy Toy, uh, uh, Tokyo Toy Fiend, if it happens to be a soft vinyl piece or uh, the Toy Chronicle over in England, uh, those people you're going to want to talk to about uh, advertising your figure, providing them information. I highly suggest creating an email press release that includes everything important about the figure, um, including photos and where they can buy it or where they can find it. Um, that really helps out the bloggers and makes it easier for them to talk about your piece. So it's a whole process. And if you want to, um, if this is something you want to learn more about, um, you can always contact us at urbanvinyldaily at gmail.com. Uh, we'd be willing to, um, you know, discuss things or help you out um, as much as we can. I mean, obviously we're relatively new to producing toys as well. Um, you can always, um, you know, like we said before, hit up people that you know. Don't just like randomly contact a whole lot of people, but you can talk to people that you know um, or maybe you follow or have contacted before about the process or, you know, maybe getting leads that way as well. 
you know, with Pokemon Stop going, you could just make a Poke Stop for your figures. <laughs> People could just check them out, check in, catch a couple Pokemon, and just look at your figure. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if they're gonna like charge people if they want to create like a poke stop at your favorite like Barnes and Nobles or something. I've heard restaurants are doing that, where it's like, "Oh, you're in our restaurant. Here's some potato wedges." <laughs> <laughs> not they're not just giving away potato wedges, but you're buying potato wedges yeah. since you went in there. Yeah. So, um, really though, like it's a it's a lot of process, it's a lot of work, uh, but it is rewarding. It's very exciting seeing um, you know your project go from 2d to 3d not for the faint of heart yeah and it, it it's a it's a long process too i mean um you're talking probably a year from inception to completion uh, when you actually get these pieces in your hands so like it's not if you're doing vinyl production if you're doing resin production you can you know if you can sculpt and cast and mold and cast relatively quickly you could probably see results in days or weeks mm -hmm. um, and i think it comes down to the complexity of your figure as far as how much is going to cost? I don't know personally that I would try to push out something that's bland and shapeless just to make it cheap and fast. So yep. you may want to weigh that option as far as maybe a more complex design, putting a little bit more money into it and maybe having a little bit of more faith in it. Yeah. And if you're going to the, um, if you're going to vinyl, um, I really would suggest contacting a sculptor that has um, created production toys in the past um, it really helps because they know what the factory needs in order to create the toy. So they'll they'll kind of help lead you down the way that hopefully you won't run into issues once you get to the factory um, as far as, you know, oh, we can't mold that. Or, oh, this should have came apart here, here, and here. You got to redo your figure. Um, so that's, a, that's another thing that, you know, a professional sculptor, uh, can really help you out with. So. What one piece of important information, learn to speak Pantone. Yeah, Pantones are um, really important if you're going to the factory because that Pantone, basically, if you don't know, is um, how everything gets a color. So every color is like an assigned a number. And that number is how the factory then mixes the paints and the plastics and whatnot as a standard. And then once they do that, that's what color you end up with. So if you tell them you want you know, color XYZ, and you really wanted color ABC, it's not gonna look right. You're gonna get a wrong color piece. And um, it's really important to, if you don't have access to a Pantone book, maybe finding someone that has them. Uh, there's little swatches and chips that you can look at that give you an idea of what the Pantone uh, actually looks like. And if you choose the right Pantones, then that thing will come out just like it's supposed to. So. It's really, that's a really, really important tip that um, I don't know that everybody jumping into um, production toys realize. So that's a that's a good one, Ben. Thanks for reminding me. I'm glad I could offer something finally. <laughs> so um, if you're looking to make a toy, though, um, make sure to contact you know contact us um, or contact you know, everybody. That you know, <laughs> not everybody. Contact some people to get some tips uh, before you jump in because it is a big plunge uh, to take. Uh, Kickstarter um, is a great way to do it, but you know you can run into issues there as well. Um, you are promising people that you're going to deliver, so if you don't know if you can deliver, don't do it. Do it on your own and try it on your own first. And with Kickstarter, honestly, you have to have a little bit of bait. You can't just say, I'm on Kickstarter, buy my figures. Yeah, You, you, have, you, you have to bait it a little bit. You have to lose a little bit of money to make the money. Yeah. You're going to end up including additional things that you wouldn't include if you sold it, um, you know, just at the store. Usually you're going to end up with additional items included in it that creates more work and it is more management. There's a lot of management that comes with Kickstarter as far as like managing the people's orders, managing their surveys, managing their uh, complaints. Their, yeah. I mean, you're going to have people that um, don't understand that when they signed up, that they actually signed up for something that maybe is nine, 10 months away from coming to their house. Um, we've, we actually had some confusion with someone that ordered and didn't realize that uh, Luna was not ready to go. Or that their credit card was expired. Or their credit card was expired. You're going to run into that as well uh, on Kickstarter. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that um, you're kind of pleasing the people that supported you. So you need to take care of them. Like it's not, it's not, Hey, give me your money and then eventually I'll ship you something. You have to keep them up to date with what's going on. You have to release information about what's going on with the factory or what's going on with the production of whatever this is that you're creating. So 
it's not take your money and run and disappear like some people have. Like the coolest. Yeah. The, the cooler that has all that stuff in it that yep. is dead broke. Yep. Well, that thing was a project that was way, it's one of those ones that like started out and even though they raised tons of money, like it's still an expensive thing to make. Yeah. And even though you sold however many units of it, you still have to make all those units. So like, and on top of that, you may have been, you know, planning to use a small distributor or a small shipper. And now suddenly you've got 75 times the orders that you thought you were going to get. The part that got them, I think, was other than redeveloping it, was shipping. That yeah. thing is huge. That's what I was going to say. And yeah. so regardless of whatever you think, it's going to cost money to ship to you. And you're going to have to ship out to countries, multiple, I guess, the United States and yep. Canada, Mexico, and the other countries across the oceans. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, really struggle with estimating the shipping cost not only from the factory to wherever it's going, but also from you, from the creator to the customer. And I think that's where a lot of Kickstarters end up having to chip in a lot of their own money. Um, I imagine that's where we'll end up having to chip in some money on our own, um, just because it's hard to estimate shipping when you don't have a solid estimate of the figure. So if you talk to, or the product you're creating, if you talk to your factory in the quote, they might be able to give you a rough estimate of size and weight based on the prototype and the photos you send them. But again, it's just a rough estimate. So you're, and you're also estimating in, we'll say January, it takes, you know, 10 months to produce it. And guess what? The post office raised their price or UPS or FedEx, whoever you want to use. So, and don't chintz out on shipping supplies. If you get busted items in the mail, no one's going to be happy and you're going to yep. be out of money and out of customer figures. service. Customer service. And another big thing is a lot of people think of is uh, if you have accessories with your figure or boxes, like our Luna has antlers and lanterns. And a box. Um, if you you need to produce extra lanterns and, and uh, antlers. And boxes. And boxes. Because there's going to be somebody that wanted a perfect box and their box came damaged. Or somebody got a figure and the antler broke. Or someone got a figure and it, the factory forgot to include a lantern. I mean, those are things that happen. Yeah. Those are things that happen and it's things you can't plan for. The only way to plan for it is to produce some extra lantern lanterns and, uh, uh, antlers and boxes and boxes. So those are all things that a lot of people don't think of, but Corey in Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Thanks for writing in. If you are a listener or a watcher or a watcher, and you have a question for urban vinyl daily, make sure to send it over to urban vinyl daily at gmail.com. Um, and maybe we'll create an episode centered around you or read it on our weekly wrap ups that you can find on our YouTube channel by subscribing to youtube.com slash urban vinyl daily or following us on Twitter and Instagram at urban vinyl daily. That's a great way to keep up with us as well. Please don't uh, send your questions to Facebook to Facebook. It's hard for us to keep up there. Uh, the, the email is really the best place to do it, but you can follow us for our latest post on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash urban vinyl daily. And uh, make sure to, you know, if you don't want to watch us, if you'd rather just download us and listen to you, listen to us while you work and, uh, you know, not have to see our smiling faces. While you're whistling while you work. You could always uh, subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean. And uh, that's where you can, you know, download the audio version of our show. So we're just all over the internet these days. And always, you can check us out at urbanvinyldaily.com where we post about everything there is to know in the designer toy art and street art world. Oh, uh, we also throw Safubi in there. So I forgot that on the piece of it. But um, thanks for writing in. Hopefully we'll get some more things like this with good questions that we can provide answers to. As always, I'm Travis. And I'm Ben. And have a great designer toy day. Hey everyone, this is Travis Likens from Token Nerd Podcast, and I'm here today to tell you something about sponsorship. That's right, Token Nerd now has a sponsor. The fine folks at TenaciousToys.com, your source for designer toys, pop vinyl, original art, and more, are now our sponsor. And guess what? As a part of that, you can get 10% off your next order at TenaciousToys.com by entering the code TOKEN10 at checkout. That's right, 10% off. And not only are they giving you this code, 
They're also going to be sponsoring many of our token nerd giveaways in the next coming months. So make sure to follow us at token underscore nerd on Instagram to catch our latest giveaways.